your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zanker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Penny. So excited to be here. It's great to have you. And I I think this, you know, your new book is coming out, version two of, you know, this topic around multitasking. I'm really excited to hear how multitasking has changed, you know, in this sort of work from home environment as we're almost a year into the pandemic. Yeah. Well, so fascinating thing about this is I already had a course on LinkedIn Learning called Time Management Working from Home. And that had been there for a year or two and not many people had been taking it. And then this happened and now everybody took it. It became the number one course of 2020. And here's the thing that that we're seeing with multitasking is a lot of companies business owners, business leaders, they're afraid that the people that they sent to work at home are going to be unproductive, right? They're going to be sleeping, right? Yeah, playing video games, whatever it is. And the reality- Do we have little trust in people? Like, what's up with that? You know, I don't know if it's so much that, but it's the fear, it's the uncertainty. Whenever something's uncertain, we don't quite know what's going to happen with it. So the real problem is in fact the opposite. The people don't have boundaries of any kind and they're working long hours. And a business this leader might see that and go, oh, that's great. We're going to get a good deal. But that's horrible uh, because it's not allowing people to have healthy balance. And so their performance is degrading over time. For sure. Because so, they're yeah, burning out. Exactly. So I, I hear yeah, that too. I was just going to say, I hear that too, that people are saying, you know, they don't stop their day. They, you know, they start way before they normally would start and they're taking less time for themselves and, and that space that they need to stay sane. Yeah. And so where the myth of multitasking comes into this is when you are constantly switching your attention, whether that's someone sending you text messages or your kids coming in and asking for something, you are only getting partial work done the whole day. And if you that continues throughout the day, by the end of the day, you go, I was working really hard. I've been working long hours, but I didn't feel like I accomplished anything. Totally. And and they probably didn't accomplish half as much, right? That's why we have those days that, you know, we feel like we're so productive and those other days where we feel like, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts type of thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's multitasking, right? Because it's a distraction for us. Yeah. And part of the problem is that the word itself is terribly inaccurate. What is most often occurring is switch tasking. And that's something I define clear in my book, which means you're trying to perform multiple tasks that require attention. And when you do that, you're not really doing any of them completely. You're just switching rapidly Mm -hmm. back and forth between all the tasks. Absolutely. That's, but we have this tendency to feel like when we're multitasking, we feel like we're getting more done. What's up with that? (laughs) Well, you know, it's funny that there've been a lot of studies of a university right in my backyard, University of Utah, and they found that people who pride themselves on multitasking are the least likely to be effective at it. And I think part of it is just the human nature and having a blind spot and thinking, if I'm good at something, I'm always good at something. And when we pride ourselves on it, we're not humble enough to recognize that things need to change. And do you think there's an emotional block there? Like I said, I mean, I've experienced this where I feel productive because I'm doing this. And emotionally, how do we get that in a different level? Like logically, I know that to be true. But at the same time, emotionally, I'm driven to do it. Yeah. First, you have to get rid of that word busy. People wear busy like it's a badge of honor, but it's really a white flag of surrender. When when you ask somebody, how are you doing? They say, are you busy? Are you busy? Oh, yeah, I'm busy. Because we pride ourselves on being constantly moving as if that uh, creates self-worth. And when someone Mm. equates their self-worth to just moving around a lot, they're really going to have a hard time giving up multitasking because it makes them feel important. Yeah, I think that's it, right? It makes us feel important. Yeah. And therefore we do it. So we have to to be able to shift that emotionally to see that we're actually even more important when we give our full attention and focus to one thing at a time. Right. Our aim, our motivation needs to be about the results that we're getting, not about how much time it took to get the results, not about how much stress we felt to get there, but did we do it? 
And if we did it, what was the outcome of it? I am a terribly lazy person, Penny. Everything in my career has been built around trying to figure out how to do it with the least amount of effort possible. But I accomplish tremendous amounts of work. I just do it in very little time. Right. It's funny that you say that because I often say that too, that I'm I'm lazy. So therefore I find the most efficient ways to do things. And I've heard so many super productive people say that. So it's funny that there's that driver there, right? Of uh, wanting to be efficient to do the things that we want to do. But yeah, our- we work very hard at doing as little work possible. <laughs> we just do it in an ethical way, right? We just try to find where are the rough edges, where are the corners, where are the, the legitimate ethical shortcuts that we can take, where I think a lot of people are, they just think this is the way it's supposed to be done. And when you do that, you lock yourself into pretty unproductive ways of doing stuff. Absolutely. I want to come back to that point that you said, you know, these ethical shortcuts, right? Shortcuts. I'm doing segment just on that of finding out what are people's shortcuts. So if I had to Mm -hmm. ask you your number one shortcut, what is it? Can I give you a concept rather than a specific execution? Then we can talk about execution. Okay. The concept that I look for is 2%, meaning a 2% increase in productivity. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, right? But a 2% increase in productivity equals an entire work week every single year. So what I'm looking for are little 2% things that add up to months out of my work time. And every time I do that, they stack on top of each other and get me a lot of time. So if you want, I can talk about some specifics. Yeah. So let's, so how do you approach that? So this week you say, all right, I'm going to find another 2%. What's your process? Yeah. So the first thing is, you know, if we're talking about the myth of multitasking, one of the biggest costs comes from the interruptions that are coming passively at us. In other words, things are interrupting us. So first I would look at like my phone, I would look at my computer, Am I getting notifications that are popping up? Every time that happens, that switches my attention away to something else. And then not only do I have the interruption, but I have to pay the recovery time to come back to the email or whatever it was I was focusing on. So I think a lot of people might be in the position where that's happening to them. Notifications from a variety of sources, cut those out and instead schedule time in your day to respond to those and look at them. Absolutely. I want to highlight what you just said about pay the recovery time. Yes. I like how you phrase that because it, it gets us into a different mindset. If we think that there's a cost, there's something that we have to pay for when we're multitasking. Yeah. There's a term in economics. It's called switching cost. And I talk about that a lot in the book, how when we switch task, we pay micro switching cost. So if, if I'm trying to type away at an email and then a text message comes in and I pick up my phone and I look at it and they ask me a question, I say the answer is 42. I put the phone back and then I have to do what? I have to go, where was I in this email? And there's just a tremendous amount of switching costs paid. You know, there's a there was a study out of the, uh, I think it was San Francisco, oh, Michigan State, excuse me, Michigan State, that a 2.8% or sorry, 2.8 second interruption results in the likelihood of mistakes doubling. Just a three second interruption increases. And you think about the cost of that. I have to go back and clean up the mistakes I made because I was interrupted by something else while I was trying to perform something important. Right. I guess we could think about that. You know, what if that's our brain surgeon that's working on the surgery for our brain? (laughs) Would we want them to be interrupted? Right. And have that. I sure uh, hope not. Right. Well, so we need to think about our clients in that way, too. Right. That it's costing them as well. Yeah. There are three basic costs. There's a fourth one that we can talk about later. But the three immediate costs are things take longer. You make more mistakes and you increase your stress levels. Mm. And you think about our world is filled with so many stress relieving outlets, right? I can pick up my phone. I can play a game. I can go get a massage. I can go for a while. I got so many different options. And yet in the history of the world, has there ever been a less or more stressed out group of people as us? And the reason why it's happening is because we're attempting to multitask almost constantly. Interesting. You know, I, I, before the pandemic, the World Health Organization had declared stress a worldwide epidemic, right? So now yeah. it's off the charts. And that's interesting, you know, that multitasking is one of those drivers. And, you know, lately I've been toying with this thought around 
the fact that we're all control freaks, mm. right? And so this idea of control, we exhaust ourselves trying to control the things that we can't control. So then when it comes to the things that we can control, we are almost powerless because we've exhausted our energy. And so I think multitasking is one of those things that maybe we do because we're trying to control. What's your thought on that? If we go a little you know, deeper into the psychology there. Yeah, I think it's not as much control in general from my perspective as it is control in the moment. We are addicted to the culture of now. And the culture of now says, if I need to do something, if I don't do it now, it's not going to get done. And if it doesn't get done now, I start to feel out of control Mm -hmm. personally. But what we want to transition to is the culture of when. The culture of when says, I will get everything done. I can get everything that's important done. I can respond to every single email. This is when I'm going to do it. Not now, but at a time that's more appropriate. And when you shift from the culture of now to the culture of when, you actually have far more control than you had before. You're just learning how to delay gratification a little Mm -hmm. bit. Yeah, we're not very good at that, right? No, no. But when you learn how to do it, you realize that you can get far more done in far less time. I mean, the the average client who goes through one of my uh, time management training programs gains an extra 40 hours per month. That's an entire work week every single month. And I've said that to clients in the past. I'm like, you're going to get that much time. And they go, they, they're thinking in the back of my mind, you are so full of it, right? That is, that's an extreme statement. But then I have clients who call me back and they're like, Dave, it's three o'clock. I don't know what to do with myself. Wouldn't that be a wonderful problem to have? And you can have that problem if you just break yourself of that cycle of constantly switching from task to task. So I'd like to go back now into your history, right? So I understand that, you know, you came to productivity for your own personal needs. Let's share with people a little bit about understanding, you know, why this is important and why you're passionate about it. Yeah. So I'll cut to the chase quickly. As psychologist, I was dealing with a lot of issues in my family life. I knew I was going to be a new father. And I saw the pattern of my father who never really learned how to focus his entire life. And I was like, this needs to change. So I went and saw a psychologist and he gave me two tests to verify it because he couldn't believe the first result. And then he said words I'll never forget. He said, you are freaking off the charts ADHD. If there were a fifth standard deviation, you'd be in it. I can say with 99.9% accuracy, you've got it. And that is my background. A lot of time management experts come from a place of perfection. They've always been in control. I come from the place of severe imperfection. And I've just had to learn how to create a system that was adapted for somebody who just really didn't have much patience for perfect. Right. That's interesting, right? So people come from different places and everybody's got a different twist. Like my twist on productivity and time management is around energy management and how we think and thinking and acting more strategically as opposed to which get us caught up in those things like perfection and procrastination and things like that. Yeah. And I completely agree with that. I like to use the term focus management. Mm -hmm. I believe that time management in its classic sense is dead. Our challenge is focus management. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a lot of times people want to know some, you've given us a lot of great topics to understand around the aspect of multitasking, you know, going about your 2% and the cost of what it's costing us. Do you have any tools that you recommend? Because people tend to, you know, they want tools, even though Mm -hmm. I know and you know that tools is the last step, right? Is you've got to get your thinking and your approach before you decide which tools. But I did want to ask you about what tools do you find are quick wins for people that they can implement and be able to see quick results? in their productivity. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm not going to be much help in that because of the very thing that you said. It's more about principles than tools. I believe that the best tools that people have are the ones that are already in front of them, which is the calendar. Most people either do not use the calendar to its full extent or they're using it improperly, like having multiple calendars and stuff like that. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So here's the principle that I teach, which is there's only one timeline. There's only one you. You're not Marty McFly where you can go into a time machine and suddenly there are two of you operating the same space. Yet I see people in their calendar 
double schedule or put appointments back to back. Like in our case, right? We had the scheduled and I said, you know, some emergency came up and I moved it back and left a buffer because I realized that it would be unrealistic for me to try and jump one to the other that fast. Yet people are scheduling their days just so tight and so much on top of each other. And when you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. So just simply using the calendar and looking at it and say, do I have breathing room? Have I created a realistic schedule for myself? That visual representation of your time budget is incredibly powerful. Absolutely. When you're using your scheduling and planning yourself out, do you plan more so by week, by month? Like what's your planning? Years, years. Years. I'm looking ahead as far as I can. On a yearly basis? Well, so here's the thing. When I have something that I want to do or need to do, I ask myself the question, when is the latest this can be done? And again, that's very different than what most people say, right? They're, uh-huh. Because they're addicted to the culture of now. Most people are only thinking of a two-week horizon in my experience. They, if you say, can you do this? They go, oh, I can't do it. Well, the reason why they're saying they can't do it is because they're only looking you know, 14 days ahead. But I look at it and go, all right, can I do this six months from now? Can I do it a year from now? Am I still going to get basically the same result if I do this? So I'm a big fan of strategic procrastination. I push things off as far as is reasonable. And what that does is that leaves room in the short term for the things that are truly emergencies and that, that crop up. Uh, for instance, like later today for the book, I have an interview with a TV station in Philadelphia. I would not have been able to do that if I had scheduled my entire day completely completely jam-packed to the seams. Right. I see that as a a key issue for people as well, is there all these back-to-back meetings. What do you recommend to the employee, right, or team member who doesn't make those meetings? They don't have the direct control and they're being booked back-to-back-to-back. What kind of recommendations do you have for them that feel kind of like they're trapped but and they don't have any ability to change it? Yeah. If only there were a book that could convince people that multitasking isn't a good thing right? I mean, I, I say well, that. Hey, but, I think there is. Yeah, exactly. The reason why I say that is because I did write the book with the intent of convincing the unconvinced. So a couple of options. One, of course, you could get the book, you could give it to people, you could uh, do a training on it. If you don't have the budget for it, that's fine. You can go to this address. You go to davecrenshaw.com forward slash exercise. And right there, you will find an exercise for free that you can do with people at work. And that will help them see it. It's a little two minute exercise that helps people see, my gosh, when we're trying to do all this stuff at the same time, we're just ruining our own success. Mm. And that's where I would come from is the standpoint of not like talking to your boss and saying, we need to stop doing this, but instead coming from the standpoint of the truth and helping them experience for themselves what is occurring when they schedule things like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I definitely encourage people to do that. And I always tell people that, you know, you have more influence than you think. If you say nothing, nothing will happen. And it's all in how you approach it. If you go and you approach your boss, you buy them this book, you influence them in different ways with the exercise and things like that. Yeah. And if I can add one more thing to that too, I like that you said that. And what I would suggest is put it in terms of their Mm self-interest. In other words, we know it stresses you out, but how does it make things better for them to not schedule? as many meetings or not schedule them close to close to each other. You know, something it's like, maybe it's like, I can do better work for you. I'd like to be able to perform better for you. It would be helpful if I could do this. Would you be okay with that? Then that way you're not trying to force your agenda. You're just trying to help them with the agenda you know they already have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and don't you find like we're already outside the box, right? So we're in the pandemic rules, you know, have been lifted or changed or removed and things are different. We're doing things differently. Isn't this a perfect time to step back as a team and to look at how you can do things differently and better? Yeah, I think that it's super helpful to just have an overall policy discussion about working from home. We're now almost a year into it. So we can ask the question, what is working and what hasn't worked? Mm -hmm. What could we do to to fix the way that we work? In fact, this brings up something that I cover in the new edition of The Myth of Multitasking, which is a channel discussion. Uh, In other words, we're communicating with each other in all these different channels, text messages, email, Slack, phone calls. It's like just an endless array But we don't have a set of ground rules for when we should use which channel and how long it's appropriate to expect a response to each channel. 
I love that. I talk about that as well. I talk about it like as a communication plan. So people know what's going to be communicated where and to set expectations. And, yeah, and I think but- that's the key thing out of it is expectations. So coming back to your point about the now, like I love that because it's true. That's where we're focused. So we think I have to answer now. And if we can set some expectation and give people that flexibility and include those expectations so that they know that they have permission not to answer now, then that, right. will, that will free them. I'm a nerd. I love Batman. And Batman, at least in the classic 60s show, he had the bat phone, right? And let's designate a bat phone. That's where the commissioner could call him and say, Batman, we need you. So we have one channel that's reserved for emergencies. And we only ever use it for not impatiencies, but emergencies. And then on the other side, we have the long-term method of communication. What's something where it's okay for us to take a week to respond to? And then you just kind of find out what's in the middle and when are we using these channels? Yeah, I love that. I love that that analogy. I think it really helps to bring it home for people, right? When we can put it in those types of analogies. That's awesome. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, before we bring the, the session to a close, I ask every guest this and every guest gives me a slightly different answer. And I find that really interesting. What's your definition of productivity and why? Okay, so productivity for me, and I share the same definition as focus, and it is allocating your time and your resources toward things which are of greatest value. And I also have another definition, which is the opposite of that, which is chaos. Chaos is allocating your time, your resources, your money toward things of variable value. And this is where it trips people up. They feel that they're being productive when sometimes things work out, when sometimes things are good, and then sometimes things are bad. But in fact, that's chaos. And chaos feeds on itself because it feels good, because, well, you know, I'm getting some work done, some nice things have turned out. But focus is strategic and productivity is strategic. It's saying, I'm only going to devote my time and my effort to things that are going to have the highest value per hour, that are going to have the biggest payoff for my business. And that subtle distinction changes everything about someone's business and career. Huge. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, we are simpatico in that context. It makes all the difference. Yeah. And And it frees people. I think what they have a hard time understanding is that when you can really focus on those things that are most important and have with clarity that they're the most important, it frees you to let go of the things that aren't as important or accept that you're not going to get perfection, like you said. So if you delegate something and someone else does it, but they don't do it to the quality standard that you do it, if it's not in your most important things, so what, right? Right. And so this requires a skill that many have not yet learned, which is the ability to say no and say it a lot and say it, you know, politely, but internally ruthlessly to say, I am going to protect myself. I'm going to protect my time. So I'm going to say no to this. And I'm only going to say yes to things that I absolutely know are of the highest value. And, you know, this is something that I teach all the time, but I relearn it every year. And I go, you know what? I've been doing this, but I could do something that is going to require, you know, 50% left effort. And it's going to take pretty much, I'm going to get pretty much the same thing. Why am I doing this thing that's taking me double the time? And it's just constantly just shaving off, shaving off, shaving off until only left with what's most valuable. Absolutely. Do you have a process that helps you Like, do you step back every week or every month to evaluate that? Like, you know, so that, like you said, we're always all learning it because it's human nature to get caught up sometimes in all that's going on. Yeah, I don't have like a formal process. Well, there's a formal process for somebody who's getting started, which is you list out all the things that you do and you determine the value per hour of each of those. In other words, how much would it cost me to replace that thing? How much would it cost me to hire someone to edit my book, for example? I'm doing it. Should I really be doing it? Can I hire someone else to do it? So that's sort of a nice starting point for anyone. At this point in my career, the process is simply taking time off. And I find that just the act of stopping, and I talk about this in a different book, The Power of Having Fun, but creating an oasis where I step away from everything. Then when I step back, my thinking is much more clear because I got away from the craziness and the hectic part of it. And I go, oh, I said no to this thing repeatedly over the last month. 
if I can keep saying no to it for a month, I could probably say no to it forever. So yeah, that's, I think that's the a natural great point. Break. Yeah, great point because it gives you a fresh look. Yes. Whereas when you're in the day to day, you just it's not fresh anymore. And you don't have to take a big vacation to do that. I believe in lots of different sizes of oases, like a daily one, a weekly one, a monthly one. And so you can take. I don't care who I'm talking to, how busy you are, how many jobs you're doing. You can take a 10 minute break to do something fun and step away from it. In fact, you must. It's critical for your success. Absolutely. And my word of the year is joy. So it goes mm-hmm. along with that fun to look for no matter what I'm doing, to find the people, the things and the opportunities to create joy and to give joy. What's your word of the year? Right now it's family. That's the most important thing for me is making sure that they're taken care of and I'm being a good husband to my wife and a good father to my children. Awesome. Well, that's a, a great word. So thank you so much, Dave. Is there anything else I want to you know, give people the link again of where they can go to uh, get more about you? You know, We'll definitely have a link to your book that's uh, connected to the show notes and everything. Before we give out any links, is there anything else that you really want to say before we end up like a final point that you want to leave? Yeah. I mentioned earlier the three effects of switch tasking. Things take longer, you make more mistakes, you increase your stress levels, but there is a fourth effect. And the fourth effect is that when you multitask on a human being, when you switch task on them, you're communicating to them that they're less important than whatever it is you're doing. So even if you think you hear this and go, ah, that's full of it, Dave, I can still be productive. I can still multitask. You cannot avoid this fourth effect. When you pick up your phone and fub on someone, you snub them in favor of your phone, you're communicating to them that they're less important. But the beautiful thing is if you're someone who instead focuses on human beings, it's an uncommon behavior these days. And so you communicate to someone that they are important and you build relationships where everyone else is just kind of damaging them. So it's, it's a wonderful principle. Just focus on human beings. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and all that you've shared today. I mean, clearly people have already clicked the link that's available here because, you know, you've added so much value and I'm sure there's that much more in the new book as it's coming out. Yeah. If you want to get the book, go to multitaskbook.com. That'll take you right there on Amazon. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Penny. And thank you all for being here because you come back to this show. It's called Take Back Time so that you can find the tips, the tricks, and the strategies that are going to help you to work smarter. So thanks for being here. And my name is Penny Zanker. As I said, this is Take Back Time, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.